Hi students, welcome to HSE Earth and Environmental Science and Module 5, Earth's Processes. This is video number 5 and we're going to be looking a little bit at multicellular life. So as we've done previously, we're still looking at um, evidence for the origins of life and this time multicellular life particularly in relation to some of the information that's come through the fossil record on the Ediacaran and Cam uh, Cambrian faunas. So what we want you to be able to do is to explain the origins of multicellular life, to describe some of the evidence from fossils in either the Ediacaran or the Cambrian uh, assemblages, and then to evaluate the evidence of both to see how we can put together this idea of uh, the first multicellular life. So up to now, we've concentrated really on the formation of organic molecules. What were some of the ideas that we had about how organic molecules formed from inorganic molecules? And this was a critical stage. Um, Richard Dawkins, in his book, The Selfish Gene, talked about uh, replicators. And before we got on to all the other fancy stuff around these uh, chemicals, we had to have specific types of chemicals that were capable of reproducing themselves um, into infinity, pretty much. Uh, and these are the ones that he called the replicators and, and talked about them quite a lot in terms of the selfish gene, how that um, section of uh, DNA was able to copy itself and uh, work together with other pieces in order to create bodies that would allow it to be uh, moved from one generation into the next. Now, in addition to these replicators, we had to have some sort of protection for them. So then we had the development of membranes. And of course, the thing that we know about the replicators, which are the nucleic acids, is that they don't just replicate themselves, but they also code for proteins. And proteins are part of this uh, protective membrane around the body of the cell. So we had to have some way of kind of condensing inside and outside of where these particular replicators were. And that formation of membranes was allowing us to start to have a separation between external and internal environment. And so that led to our first types of actual um, cellular life, the first prokaryotic cells, the very simple ones. We've talked about them before, the archaea and the bacteria that we think were at the beginning of this whole process. From prokaryotic cells, we think um, probably some sort of symbiosis or perhaps even just through um, an ingestion but not a digestion, um, that, that some of these different types of cells started to come together and form little tiny groups. And we know that in eukaryotic cells, what characterizes eukaryotic cells is their uh, membrane-bound organelles. So even at this early stage, we started to have this sense of specialization of different areas in the cell doing different things. A nucleus, uh, mitochondria, chloroplasts, all having a specific and critical function uh, within the cells. From eukaryotic cells, then we started to diversify. So um, a series of eukaryotic cells that all kind of hang around together um, are colonial cells. Now, the key difference between colonial cells and multicellular organisms is specialization or the lack of. So specialization is characteristic of multicellular organisms. So we can have lots of cells in a little clump together. Uh, experiments have been done with things like sponges, where you can squeeze all the cells through a sieve and they'll reform the sponge. Obviously, if you squeeze all my cells through a sieve, that's the enemy. I'm not going to uh, reconstitute myself. And that's it's a very uh, gory, I guess, but it's a very simple idea of the difference between colonial organisms, which are unspecialized cells that kind of hang around together to help each other out in a kind of symbiotic way, and multicellular organisms, which have now become so specialized that they can't survive without one another. So what do we need for multicellular life? Well, we need four Cs, basically. We need congregation. So we need the cells to hang around together. Now, this is similar to the sort of thing that happens in colonial cells. Uh, so we need to distinguish between these. We need communication. So we need the cells to be able to communicate um, in a two-way kind of relationship one to the other so that they know what they're doing where they are 
uh, and also so that there's some um, ability to facilitate the third of these C's, which is cooperation. How do the cells work together? If you're going to specialize, then the cells by their nature of specialization become better at doing some things and not so good at other things. So therefore, if they're not so good at some things, there has to be other parts of the organism that are going to be able to take responsibility for those things um, and ensure that the organism functions as a single unit rather than a whole heap of, of individuals. And complexity is really about specialization, but um, I didn't really want to have the three C's and one S. Uh, and complex kind of tells you that the cells are becoming a little bit more complex through their developmental stages. They're not just all becoming lots and lots of identical cells. They're actually becoming specialized to have specific functions. So those four C's, congregation, communication, cooperation, and complex, that's really the key to multicellular life. And once that started to happen, we see um, evidence of that in the fossil record going back a long time. Possibly um, some red algae around about the um, 1.2 billion years ago mark is maybe where we're seeing some of this, this idea of multicellularity. Obviously, there's, there's evidence in the fossil record. We'll have a look at some of this in class. Um, that's not always, uh, that not everyone always agrees upon. And this is one of the things that's really interesting about the study of fossils because it's like solving a mystery. It's like solving a puzzle. How do you put the pieces together and make a story? So we want um, bioecological stories. We want biogeographical stories. Um, we want to be able to look at anatomy, physiology. We want to try and work out what the function of these things was. Some of these um, fossilized organisms are so unique that they don't have any modern analogs. They don't have anything similar to what we see now. So they're a great study, but it does make it a little bit difficult. So what we do see is we saw um, some sort of very primitive worm-like kind of creatures, which again were in these around about um, billion year old rocks. And an important, um, I think, clue here is a decline in stromatolites. So remember the stromatolites are just basically these little um, bacterial beds, cyanobacteria building these little, little uh, beds of uh, mat and um, sediment alternating uh, as they built their way up towards the towards the light to, to gather the light for photosynthesis. But we do see around about a billion years ago that the stromatolites start to decline in the, in the fossil record. And perhaps that's suggestive of, say, a predator that was now capable of um, successfully grazing on those um, bacterial mats. So really, um, despite the fact that there's a few little ideas about some of these things popping up earlier, the two key ones that we're going to look at are the Ediacaran fauna and the Cambrian fauna. The Ediacaran is a nice one uh, for us Aussies because it has um, a local uh, flavour to it. The Ediacaran Hills in the Flinders Ranges of South Australia is where a lot of these fossils were found. Some of them first found in these uh, in this site, and um, and, the, and the site itself was quite diverse in terms of the number of different types of organisms that were found in the rocks. They, um, the Ediacaran fauna is basically a filter feeding fauna. So most of them are, are relatively sedentary. You had um, Dickinsonia, Dickinsonia uh, which is this one, which kind of looks a little bit worm-like, slightly segmented. So we are starting to get to something that looks a little bit different. These sorts of sea pens, um, uh, which were also uh, characteristic of the Ediacaran fauna, was starting to suggest some levels of specialization, structures that were not all the same. And so that is starting to give us this idea of multicellularity, of, of specialized cells for specialized functions. But this was primarily a filter feeding fauna. It was shallow water, continental shelf kind of uh, environments. Um, and most of the organisms here were fairly sedentary. At the end of the Ediacaran period leading into the um, Paleozoic era, we have this explosion, and it's often referred to as the Cambrian explosion. And that's because of this magnificent diversity that was seen in the fossil record, especially in places like the Burgess Shales. Um, and you can see in the little uh, slide I've got here, 
uh, graphic showing some of the reconstructions of some of these different and very unusual organisms. What happened here was you just had this sudden appearance of multiple animal phyla. So that included things like mollusks, arthropods, uh, echinoderms, brachiopods, um, the, the characteristic uh, trilobite group that was going to last for a long time through the fossil record but didn't make it uh, with any um, descendants in, in any groups today, um, were all present at this point uh, in the Cambrian um, rocks. And, and I think probably one of the keys to this was the development of hard parts, the actual um, presence of chitinous exoskeletons. We see specific mouth parts. We see specific eyes or things that look like they would have functioned as eyes, stomachs, stuff that was actually quite specific uh, and quite new in terms of the way that uh, these animals now, were now appearing in the fossil record. As I said, there were some unique organisms. Anomalocaris was one that caused some, some problems for some time trying to figure out what it was. Uh, Hallucigenia, which you can kind of tell from its name, was a most unusual organism. And we'll look at some of these in a little bit more detail uh, in class. But there were three ideas about the Cambrian fauna. Um, there's, there's an environmental explanation. Was it the increasing amount of oxygen that was available that was actually now... Um, providing that opportunity for so much more diversity than what we had previously. Was it a hangover from snowball earth? So the snowball earth was around about 630 million years ago. Um, so there seems to be a little bit of a gap. Um, obviously you'd want the, the um, waters to warm, maybe a shift away from an ice age into a warmer time facilitated this um, increase in diversity. Maybe it's a question of ecology those sort of sedentary, quiet organisms, no real predators. Now, um, organisms that were able to predate not only uh, would have had a, a feast on their hands, but would have perhaps driven the evolution of hard parts, of protective coverings, uh, of a, a um, free swimming lifestyle. So a whole lot of things that may have uh, changed as a result of one or other organism starting to develop and therefore driving the ecology of the whole area. Maybe it was even something to do with genetics, the way that um, sequences of genes turn on and off in order to facilitate embryonic development or the development of particular structures and specialised cells in particular regions so you don't get um, legs growing out of your head, that sort of thing. And so maybe if there was some time associated with that development um, of these genes, Hox genes, they're often referred to, um, we've looked at uh, how these work in things like fruit flies and, and mice, and there does seem to be some very specific ways in which they operate and how you can actually change them too. But that's a story for another time. These are just some of the ideas um, around why we just found this mag massive diversity in the Cambrian fauna. Um, and of course, another option is that they were all on the way through these last several million years until they've appeared in the record, they just hadn't been fossilised, they just hadn't been anywhere, or maybe they are and we haven't found them yet. So these are all some of the ideas that come out as we look at different fossil assemblages and try and put together the story of what we see. We will look at both of these, the Ediacarans and the Cambrian faunas, in a little bit more detail in class. Thanks for watching.